So I wanted to welcome everyone um, as you enter into our second DETI Day, Design Educator Typography Intensive. I'm Gloria Kontrup, and I am the Executive Director of the Hoffman Smokepin Center for Typography. And um, this is our second, like I said, our second day. And I want to uh, thank Google for their sponsorship, uh, past sponsorship and continuing sponsorship. I also want to say that I want to thank our um, HMCT staff, we could not do this without them. They are invaluable and they are behind the scenes. So I know they're listening. And also to all the attendees. I think the attendees without you, without your support, why would we do this? So we're very grateful for people's interest. Um, our keynote speakers today are Kathleen and Christopher Sloboda from Drawdown Books. Um, Drawdown, which is what I love about them, is an independent publisher. And you're located, I believe, in Connecticut. Yeah, right. And they, in, in your bio, it says Northeast. And they um, publish and distribute books about graphic design, typography, illustration, photography, art, and architecture. And I find your, your, um, your bibliography to be quite unique and expansive compared to, let's say, large publishers. You do give smaller publishers an opportunity to have their books seen. Um, you'll talk about future trends of design and books, which is great. Both are graphic designers, I believe. Both are educators. Um, Christopher, you're currently an associate, assist, associate professor of art, a graphic design at Boston University. You both, and Kathleen, you teach, are currently teaching at <coughs> RISD. <laughs> hey, competition is good. Um, and you are both the co-founders of Drawdown Books. I believe you graduated from Yale, the master's program in Yale. And Christopher, did you go to, I don't think you were at Yaley. You yeah. are a Yaley too? Oh my Lord. Okay, we've got two <laughs> Yaleys. Well, I've had some former students that are also Yaley. So I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna welcome you both again. Um, I'm so pleased that you agreed to do this. It's it's again, it's such a pleasure. I, I am such a, an admirer of what you do and the energy that you put towards publishing and books and support of the community. I mean, it's it's amazing that you actually have time to do this. So I will disappear. Questions go into Q and A. If there's any problems, don't worry. We're in the background. And please welcome Christopher and Kathleen Sloboda of Drawdown Books. Thank you. Great. Uh, well, thank, thank you, Gloria, um, so much for the invitation, for that excellent introduction. Uh, can everybody see the screen OK? Um, and as we begin, we just want to thank everyone for being here to start with a note of gratitude. Um, thank Gloria for inviting us for this opportunity to, to address all of you. I, I saw people checking in from Montreal, Southern California. So we really have an international crew and I'd like to thank Clifford Pun as well, who is really integral to our, our invitation here and all the sort of support and everyone at HMCT um, who has worked to make this possible. So we're presenting uh, Facing Pages, Typographic Invention in Contemporary Publication Design as part of HMCT's Design Educators Typography Intensive. Very happy to be here. We're Drawdown Books, as Gloria mentioned. I'm Christopher Sloboda, and this is Kathleen Sloboda. And we're joining you, as Gloria mentioned, from Connecticut. We're actually located on the ancestral homelands of the Quinnipiac people. Um, so the first thing we thought we'd tell you a little bit about our ink drawdowns. Um, if anybody here has done any offset printing, you might have come into uh, contact with something like this. But when you're proofing a job and thinking about what colors you want to use and what kind of paper, you can ask the printer to create an ink drawdown for you. So basically, they'll mix that specific Pantone color on various different paper that you're interested in, and you can compare uh, what, which, how the color is working um, compared to seeing it in the Pantone book. Um, so uh, we've done a lot of design over the years and have made many, many uh, ink drawdowns. Um, and it's just really loved that process. So that obviously became the inspiration for the name of our publishing firm when we decided that we wanted to undertake publishing ourselves, not just for clients, but to do art direction and publishing under our, our own sort of aegis. So we were doing a lot of uh, design work for cultural institutions and museums. 
um, and wanted to start something where we can explore our own sort of methodical examination of production. And that's how we arrived at the name Drawdown. Uh, our logo is typeset in the typeface brown by a real sack. Um, so, and our idea was that we would publish to test different formats. Um, also, we didn't have large budgets, so we really embraced the idea of uh, small, small publications. And I would say to Gloria's point about our catalog, including both sort of modest um, self-published work as well as more professional or commercial publications, if you look through Drawdown, some of this comes for our appreciation for the little guy who's making their own books. So uh, yeah, one of the first tote bags we made was 16 pages, uh, just really embracing uh, the small format. And, and actually the tote bag format was something we played around with initially. Uh, an, another first year tote was, I want to publish zines and rage against machines, which were lyrics from Harvey Danger's flagpole Sitta. Um, all, there are no winners, we all lose, which are lyrics from Embrace's money. And this was kind of getting at some of uh, the ideas. Kathleen and I both came from punk rock uh, backgrounds and this sort of like ethos of DIY and you know changing the world for the better and making a difference. Um, were things that were really driving us. So how can we experiment, but also do, do good with the work that we're doing? Uh, another tote bag was, you think you're so different, you haven't made a difference. Lyrics from Lifetime's Ferret. And we brought this to the very first art book fair uh, that we went to, which happened to be at the I Never Read Art Book Fair in Basel, Switzerland in 2012. Um, and it was interesting because while this kind of, um, you know, uh, semi-confrontational language was you know right at home in the states here. Uh, many people were coming up to the table in Switzerland, going, "Well, oh, this is this is quite uh, you, you may be offending people here." So it was really great for us right off the bat to kind of um, engage with interact uh, in, international audiences and see that things are really different. And and we, it made us so much more interested in meeting all of the published here shirts here and bringing some of that back to the U.S. and sharing and that sort of dialogue and exchange. Um, and then after many, many tote bags, we felt we'd make a tote bag about just too many tote bags in general and not enough books. Some of our earliest uh, publications were um, vehicles uh, to put together a lot of random projects we've done over the years. Kathleen and I also do work under the moniker Glue Kit, which is a photo illustration studio. And we've done a lot of these just kind of experimental photos of form. Um, so Glue Kit made, quote unquote, made photographs was one of our earlier publications, and this was printed offset in one color, which was a nice way to sort of tie together all of this disparate work with earlier digital cameras. And I would also say that I think, you know, it's important to mention that when we first started Drawdown, we conceived it really as a way to do our own publications and it's evolved through time. So that's why we're sort of introducing you to the, the roots of the project and then we're going to trace how it, how it begins to um, eclipse a, a lot more. Um, and we were typeset this in a customized version of Bembo, so you can see a little detail here. Uh, another uh, publication that we did of our own work was Le Jacan et le Cadre, which kind of just when we're traveling, how can we make a publication? Um, so this was uh, visiting the Louvre and just seeing the sort of mad um, kind of chaos surrounding the Mona Lisa and the way everybody was viewing the work through the frame of their, their smartphones. Um, so we just spent a whole afternoon sort of documenting this. Um, and this was also an experiment in digital publishing. So we knew this, uh, we wanted to do a much smaller edition and how, how would this look at, in a digital format? So using a sort of blue blurb and Lulu. And really like what really drove us in those early days was the printed image. We were really obsessed with uh, doing photo books in because of stuff, some stuff we were doing um, as commissioned work. Uh, the very first publication was called Luck by a, San, I think San Francisco based photographer, Isaac McKay Randozzi, who was shooting on film, a lot of skateboard street culture. He was using a 35 millimeter camera, um, a special one that would give you two frames per uh, 35 millimeter frame. So it was these uh, interesting proportions, but very economic way of shooting shooting on film. And this was printed in two color duotones. So really experimenting with a gray and a black to give uh, richer, denser photographs. And here you can see uh, the press sheet um, and some of the proofs here as well. So just the joy of going into the printer and, and, and printing it and having photographers trust us with that process. 
Um, another early experiment was with Andy Reeser, who's a Los Angeles-based photographer um, who did a lot of shooting. So to get him to allow us to print his black and white or color photographs in a sort of Pantone blue on gray paper. And, and we're curious what that looked like and how that added to the sort of haunted feeling of his camera. His studio photography was called Haunted Camera um, at that time. Um, so, that, and also like printing with Pantone colors and ink drawdowns um, is great because you can't predict it on screen. So it's really that kind of process of getting out there and doing it and that gives you these kind of different surprising um, results. Uh, another early publication called Pretty Much. Um, we were spending a lot of time on Tumblr in, in those days, and there's just a real uh, like splurge of um, photographers publishing work every day of portrait photography that they are doing. Um, and you'd get this endless stream of new, fascinating photography. So we were interested in kind of capturing that moment and, and um, printing it on newsprint, uh, a newsprint broadside to kind of see, you know, from pixel to sort of lower res print dot, and also the, kind of make a comparison to the temporality of both the stream of now Instagram because Tumblr, it was actually hard to get a good Tumblr photo um, because the photographers really aren't using it um, to, to the newsprint. Um, and all of those earlier publications were really, I think what got us motivated was the photographer Robert Adams and his relationship to photo books. So Kathleen and I both have the our first edition of Robert Adams' The New West, Landscapes Along the Colorado Front Range. Um, and this was, I think, published in 1974. And what was amazing about Robert Adams is he was interested in the photo book even more than the original photograph. So my experience prior to this would be, you know, the photograph that hung on the wall, the original, how that printed was, you know, the top. But for, for Adams, it was really the photo book. Like he took the photos to put them into a book, to sequence them, to think about how the, what kind of story he can tell. Um, and when you look at the attention to the spreads, um, the, the impeccable, intricate way he composed these photographs, the elements within these photographs is also evident in how he wanted to place uh, the captions also, he, he, he had an interest in the typography, even uh, the punctuation, um, like the period here is sort of Adam's uh, style point, and the page numbers as well. We're all very considered in, in Adam's approach to the photo book. The subtitle or the caption and the page number also had a relationship to the backside of the photo on the previous page. And I would always say to people when talking about photo books and designing photo books that because of the minimalism and the spareness of the typographic elements, they become of even more importance. And thinking about like the the balance and the 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 way that the color works on the page, it becomes a sort of like a mini sort of pure exercise in, in that sort of um, design layout. Yeah, and and the margins as well were, were, were uh, interesting. So not only was Adam's uh, passion for the photography and the book format sort of be becoming more and more evident to us, but also his interest in the typography that he was using, like what typefaces were saying a lot about what he wanted to say about the stories he was telling with his book and with his book work. Um, so the New West here um, set in Optima, Herman Zaff, 1952, um, really looks beautiful and, and works quite nicely with the photographs. And I think this is a, a, you know, a sand serif, but it's kind of want, you know, hinting at these serifs. And I think for us, it had this interesting relationship to the landscapes that Adams were that was documenting these nature spaces now being inhabited by new suburban houses and structures so it's this kind of in-between state um, years uh, years uh, later I, I also uh, had the opportunity at the Yale Art Museum where I was the head of design to do a title wall for a Robert Adams exhibition the place we live and Adams was also very involved in uh, the typographic choice here Diotima um, which we used. Well, and I just want to say when I was researching this that um, Gudrun Zav von Haas was um, Herman Zaff's wife, and she actually produced Diotima the year before Optima was released, um, and it was used on their wedding invitation. And one of the things that I love is that she talks about the importance in calligraphy and all of the typefaces that she designed. Um, but I'd really encourage you to look into her practice. Um, she's got a tremendous um, sort of 
uh, oeuvre to, to look into. And there was a publication two years ago um, that sort of covers all of her typefaces and her calligraphy. And this, the, the, the photos in this exhibition um, were published in a three volume set that Steidel recently um, re-released. Uh, so it, it's sort of great to see this carry forward and to see Adam's books uh, now on Steidel. And Steidel, in case you don't know, they are a German publisher who in the 90s, um, they started a photo book program and they're really seen as so, sort of producing the most beautiful, exquisite, they're like master printers. It, it's one man runs and is, is involved in each of the, the publications they produce and they put out about 300 books a year. So if you ever have an opportunity to look at a Steidel book, I'd, I'd encourage you to pick it up, to smell it and to look through the pages because it is just in its, its physicality, beautiful objects to, to encounter. Uh, and a few years ago, I had the opportunity to design a new photo book for Robert Adams called Skogan. Um, and this was set in Koch Antiqua and Eva Antiqua. And of course, Adams was very involved in, in the type typography, which was a great uh, experience. Um, and here's one spread from the book. And one interesting aside is that we had a very like lousy color laser printer and we would send Robert Adams the, the proofs and they all had a kind of a green tint to it. But you know that unexpected surprise he actually quite liked. And then uh, the curator and Robert Adams, when it went on press, all the photos were tinted with the Pantone green. So um, you know it's kind of interesting sometimes. And I think for us, these sort of unexpected uh, things that evolve out of the experience of working and producing a book, the stories that are embedded in the production become really interesting um, as, as booksellers, but as designers to share with other designers. I think it's also being open to the unexpected in the design process. But so to, to so essentially uh, for us, Robert Adams, both his interest in the photo book, his passion for the photography and bringing in the typographic element is this perfect kind of marriage for us. And we also later learned that uh, Robert Adams' wife, Kirsten, is a calligrapher. Here is a photo by uh, Robert Adams of Kirsten at her calligraphy table, which uh, we can see now has played a, a, a nice, nicely influenced Robert Adams' uh, love for the letter forms. Um, a project that we did more recently, completely different than uh, Robert Adams, is a book called Hardcore Fanzine. Uh, and it's about uh, Good and Plenty, which was produced in Chicago by a high school student named Gabe Rodriguez starting in 1989. Um, and uh, here's the cover of it that has different fragments from some of Gabe's zines, which were all done on the photocopier. Um, and this, this is uh, Good and Plenty Fanzine number three, which I had told Kathleen was one of the first pieces of graphic design I ever sort of came into um, contact with that made me want to make graphic design. And I think I was a freshman in high school and my friend said, oh, Chris, here, you send a dollar to this place in Chicago. I think you'll like this zine. And I immediately wanted to make my own zine. Kathleen was uh, originally trained as an archivist. So she had said that we should reach out to Gabe to see if he still has these materials. Um, it would maybe be an interesting publication. So Gabe uh, did actually have this entire box of all seven issues, all of the original paste up. So we were really excited about what we can potentially you do. You know, there was a sentimental part of it for us, but when we saw the actual archive, we realized that it was a case study in, in uh, evolving technology, basically. When Gabe started, he was working in a very sort of raw paste up um, capacity, you know, but then desktop publishing was coming to the fore. So the tools that he had at his disposal changed, he was getting a little bit older and he was in the unique position that his father was also a pressman at an offset printer. And so the last issues are offset printed. So the, in the seven issues, there's this really nice kind of story of technological evolution that we could uh, kind of cycle and, and use as a lens to bring in sort of graphic designers and typographers and have them look at this and consider this as, as sort of a case study. Yeah, and I had told Kathleen, like starting with issue number four, you know, it was printed on colored paper and the black ink just kind of sat on the paper a little better. And I had no idea the difference uh, as a high school student in the, in the 90s, the difference between photocopiers or offset printers. Um, but there was something that drew me to that quality of it. You know, it was like, it was heightened. It just felt nice. Um, so, um, so the original mock-ups are quite fascinating. Gabe, who uh, didn't go on to be a designer, which is pretty surprising because a lot of uh, 
people who did do zines really um, ended up in careers in design. But Gabe used basically this single uh, typewriter, um, glue and, and photocopied different um, band logos and took photos and sometimes had them half toned. But there was a real honesty to the layout. It was accessible. It was sort of like straightforward, uh, very legible. Um, and what we wanted to do, though, is we saw a lot of like books and documentaries about these music scenes that we had a connection to that were often only done by people within the scene. And they're sort of looking back two, three decades later, kind of nostalgic about it and, you know, just remembering the good old times. So we were not interested in doing anything like that. And it took us a lot of time of how can we kind of really what we want to do with Drawdown is kind of bridge different communities and scenes and the sort of marriage between these subcultures and also looking at it through a new lens. So for example, vernacular design, as well as commercial design, sort of having all these juxtapositions is really interesting to us. So, you know, how do we look back at something like this through the lens of graphic design? We had a host of really great contributors, Briar Levitt, for example, who um, at first said, well, I don't know much about punk. I shouldn't be writing this. And we're like, that's exactly why we want you to write this. Um, she writes about the history of the photocopier as being this revolutionary tool for, uh, you know, people in the music scenes and different subcultures. Um, we have uh, Ali Kadir, who talks about like networks of trading zine culture at that time. Um, but really, I think really well-rounded. And one just contributor that really relates to typography uh, was Christian Henson's article um, essay about- And Christian Henson, in case you don't know him, he's a Filipino American designer who runs hardworking, good looking, which is really focused on sort of Filipino vernacular design, as well as looking at the Filipino diaspora. So Christian, uh, who, who was a Yale MFA and his thesis was also kind of on like metal music from a certain genre. Um, he, he, this, this section is called the kids will have their say. And Christian traces these two particular typefaces as they're related to these uh, youth crew sort of hardcore subcultures. Um, and he notes that SSD controls 1982 record is the first sort of uh, band in these, in these circles, the first wave of hardcore um, to use City by George Trump, which was a typeface from 1930s. So this SSD control record from this Boston band ended up having for the next 10 years, many, many bands using this to kind of say they're also a part of this like musical scene um, happening. And it sort of just happened pre-internet, right? Through, through the distribution of these records on a, on a relatively small scale. And the next typeface that kind of grabbed fire was Princetown by Dick Jones, a typeface created in 1981. Um, and this you can see was a, a record that still is quite influential today, judges bringing it down in 1989. And this spawned even more and more usage of this. So these were uh, uh, scenes of kids who liked heavy music, who liked metal, but didn't want to sing about sort of destructive things. They wanted their music to be more positive. They didn't want long hair and to wear all black. It, Kathleen likes to wear black, but they wanted, they had a more clean cut look, right? Uh, buzz cuts and shorts and champion sweatshirts and Nike high tops. So the typography was really like a huge part of defining this subculture of what this music was being kind of more straightforward, honest, uh, clean. There's a clean quality to it. Um, healthy living, a lot of uh, hardcore music um, took on a drug free, so no alcohol, no drugs. So a year later, uh, 1996, Floor Punch is still using it. And you can see these two typefaces, Princetown um, is being used beyond the United States. So here, uh, True Fight is a new Japanese hardcore band that used Princetown on their 2019 demo. And then they also are using City uh, in their 2020 uh, Reason to Believe 7 Inch. So we're just fascinated by Christian's article and tracing the, the power of particular typefaces and what they can kind of continue to communicate for like three decades um, in, in what they what they mean. Um, the one thing that Kathleen and I really love is books as resources. Um, through Drawdown, uh, we have our publishing projects, but what we really got very excited about too was how, what do we do beyond publishing? And we early on started to curate an online shop. So we really wanted to kind of bring uh, publications that were hard to get that we were always getting excited about. 
we also really saw a need for this and that we, as we were, you know, going to fairs, going to schools, we were meeting people um, who had produced books and didn't necessarily have, um, you know, streams of distributing them, um, didn't have ways of getting them out in the world. And we would see them be like, oh, we know people would be really excited about this. And we realized that Drawdown could be sort of a platform or a hub for that sort of exchange. So here's our, our website where you can find you know, over a thousand different titles from big publishers to small publishers, all related around graphic design, typography, architecture, photography, art books. And we really feel like for students of design as well as professionals, like looking is learning. If you're designing a book, you really wanna look at a lot of other books and not just to see what to do, but also to see what not to do. What do you like about this book? What do you not like about this book? So for us, in the projects we do and what we um, say with our students is really just like looking is learning, continue to look, look at everything, examine all the time. Uh, one of the books that we sell um, often and are excited to carry and love to see every year is the most beautiful Swiss books. So seen here is the 2019 edition. It changes every year. This was an awards that uh, started in 1943. And is it every year that they put out a book? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, really it changes format. So you can see 2018 has this reflective foil. 2017 is quite minimal and stark. Um, 2014 has a you know, interesting detail. 2012 was a bit more conservative and, and understated. Um, and often you'll get information, uh, contextual information about the specs of these books, some information descriptions, and then <clears throat> so the, the annual compendiums are also useful because the form of the final compendium often is of interest to designers. But then there's all the technical specifications, the sort of typefaces that are being used that are being seen as being evaluated by these international juries as as being of interest and also notes about the production of the book so the binding the page the the um the the different sorts of lithography that's used and i think these become really important um they're great resources to go back to over time you know if you're you're stuck um to kind of look at publications and and get a snapshot of their their physical manifestation so it changes designer each time but essentially you're going to get this kind of information like a, a a treatment of maybe the cover and then some some biographical details about the publication but one one recent uh publication of the most beautiful swiss books that really captured our attention because they uh, they went about it a, such a completely different way it was done by hubertus design the cover is hard to tell online because it's all white but if we get this nice detail shot with some raking light you can see some of the beautiful um embossed texture um and type type typography here but what they did was sort of analyze they said what is it that makes a it a beautiful Swiss book. So they kind of analyzed it in this very scientific method, you know, here the materiality of every cover. And the other annuals often would separate like here's book A, here's book B, here's book C. But here we're looking at a small segment of all of the books together, but a, a specific detail. So the finishing, the materiality sort of zoomed in. What is the halftone screen that these were printed at, right? The registration, how good is the registration of the printing? Because the printing says a lot about what's going to make a great book or what's not going to make a great book. The binding, what kind of differences in binding are happening um, from round top to, to flat? Um, also how it lays when it's open, which are some beautiful photography here. Uh, this was a, we were cracking up when we saw this, but how bendable is the book? The, I think all qualities that we should be considering when we're, we're putting together a, a book proposal. The spines, which is often how you're going to meet a book. Um, and then they get into the type styles with some interesting details here. You see what typefaces are being used. They examine the ligatures here, F, some FF, FL, FI ligatures. Uh, footnotes and endnotes, how are they treated within the overall uh, layout of the books? Uh, the gray value of the typography, which is looking at the, the, you know, the size of the type, the letting, the, also the top and bottom margins here are being sort of scientifically analyzed. What, are there arrows, the ellipses? So, I mean, that is the kind of book when we have in person, people just can't, can't. And I also it. just have to say respect to the designers for designing an all white sort of invisible cover, because that that's one of the biggest trends that we see as booksellers is because so many, so much of the book trade happens online. There's a legibility issue with sort of making things readable at a thumbnail size for a cover, um, you know, 
especially if that's your first um, inclination, like a, the first introduction that you have with a potential audience um, is, is that cover to just white out everything <laughs> takes a lot of confidence. But I think um, it definitely works better in person where a person can immediately sort of start to flip through and see like the glorious uh, interior of this, this publication. So another series that Kathleen and I love to uh, carry and see every year is the best Dutch book designs. Um, so the 20, 29, 2009 uh, cover here is a bit more conservative, but actually it, like when we photographed it, it's quite, the pattern's quite spectacular. Um, and this was a competition that began in 1926 and is considered Europe's oldest such event. Um, or, or Team Tuesday recently did the 2019 edition, um, which you can see here is, which is fabulous. So again, you're going to get to like, not only is the book itself a sort of work of art, but then it's covering what's considered all of these really great books. So you might get one year, you know, some descriptive information, all of the sort of tombstone data and some spreads in color. Another year, you might get less sort of technical specs, maybe just a, a black and white, black and white reproduction. So it really is interesting to see how the different designers each year uh, do it. So really, this is like, a double dose of great book inspiration because it's a, a really well-designed book about other well-designed books. And we, we especially look for books about books. Like we carry books about architecture books, books about uh, other books that we think are of interest to designers that have very kind of interesting um, sort of design aesthetics that we think could be considered um, a, 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 a source of inspiration. Um, but really like the ones that are quite always get us excited are when the form takes usually interesting turns. So here there's a different tab for each book. So this is just a, a kind of fun, even more fun to use, right? And then uh, this is a favorite where from 2014 where the typography, it's a really thick brick-like book, hand size, and the typography on the spine sort of wraps around from the back cover to the front cover. Um, so again, another just fascinating uh, 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 solution there. And again, we always say looking is learning. So we just think looking at so much of this stuff is going to drive you forward to make better design. Another just fabulous um, item in the drawdown inventory is from the Chamont Poster International Poster Competition. Kathleen and I were there a few years ago. Um, so this is Le Cine Museum, which is in Chamont, France. Um, it's the poster museum for the, the country of France, um, but it's actually in this very tiny French town about an hour outside of Paris. Yeah, it's like France's first graphic design museum. It's this really kind of great modernist building in this quaint little town. Um, and hopefully there'll be more graphic design museums in the future. So. Kathleen and I spent the day uh, walking around this exhibition, taking in these beautiful posters. Uh, it's just a wonderful space. And as we were kind of getting ready to leave, we saw that they had all of these uh, catalogs from previous years. And we hadn't seen these before. We were like, we have to get these for drawdown. So as soon as we got back, Kathleen um, you know, got, made it happen. And the 2017 edition was the first one that we carried. I think we were the only distributor in the United States. So we were bringing these to book fairs everywhere. And it had a great production too. It was screen printed on this plastic plexi. It had exposed binding, this gold foil stamp on the um, interior printed cover. And then inside was just this lush, sort of wall-to-wall -wall color posters of all of the best posters um, within the, the last for the year. And this, this is uh, biennial. biennial. So every two years. So just a fabulous resource. And once they sell out of this, they don't print more. So it's the kind of thing you want to get when you can, because um, they're, they're very difficult to track down. So again, this was one of our, the kind of things that like we want to draw down to do, which is to make accessible these kind of rare, but important uh, publications to the history of international graphic design. Um, and then the 2019 edition, you know, a lot of these things where you have different designers, it's a pendulum swing, right? So from this like bleed, full bleed color uh, to Inez's more minimal textual, um, all white cover here. Um, and, and her approach is really about making transparent sort of the skeleton of the design behind and using sort of the effects of the making um, and embodying that in the design itself. Right. So here you can see that the title is sort of like the title of the file. It's a .pdf and the work is captioned .jpeg2 in the way that the different designers would submit it. Um, so you have a lot more white space here. There's more textual information that sort of comes into the spread 
um, here, a little detail for you. And then again, excellent, really inventive posters and great resource um, to see how, what happens two years later. Um, so we are excited. And one thing I love too about um, international poster competitions and the annuals that come from them is seeing how expressive the posters can be um, across language, like how the form can work to be expressive. Um, and then the way that those, those posters can continue to function, even if the legibility of the type um, is, is something that the designer has, has subdued. So they're really different. Um, some of the older editions are much bigger with a lot more, many, many more essays, less kind of visual in terms of like um, focusing so much on the posters themselves, but a lot of this additional information. There is one in 2013 that caught our attention. It was a two-part book. Um, and in the intro letter, uh, I think this was designed by Obake. <laughs> Obake with Bryn Lloyd. Um, and they had kind of written about how influential dot, dot, dot was um, to them and essentially designed the entire thing exactly like an issue of dot, dot, dot. Um, and dot, dot, dot is the kind of thing Drawdown would love to carry any copies available, was um, a very influential graphic design magazine. Here's issue 12 from 2006 um, and, and designed by, uh, created by Peter Villock and Stuart Bailey. And I believe that AIGA Ion Design just recently wrote about Jared Fuller wrote an article that called dot 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 um, the most influential graphic design journal that you've never heard of. But I, I actually suspect that many of you have probably heard of it and seen it. Um, and it, I think it was produced um, until 2010 with two um, issues a year. Um, so uh, you can still track down copies if you go on a Libris or a books. <laughs> but this is what we love this kind of looking as learning right so these designers, Abake, um, kind of like, you know, it's clear they looked a lot at dot, dot, dot. It's, it's in their fiber as designers and they wanted to pay tribute and kind of homage to that dot, dot, dot in their approach um, to in 2011 to the, how they wanted to treat that annual. And this idea of conversations um, across time is really interesting to us. And we're, we're seeing that as continuing in the future as books continue to respond to what's come before. Um, I think there's always this way that books are sort of continuing conversation as Christopher mentioned, the pendulum that swings um, as designers take on the mantle for sort, sort of ongoing um, book series, but also the way that one-off books will respond to what's come before, or they're, they're really you know, engaging with the type history and the design history that has preceded them. And because we love looking, we're always, and, and we love conversations, we're, we're, we're always looking at the way books approach dialogues, right? So, how, and how do you build dialogues through type? We have a couple of samples we've pulled here from books that, that we represent, but Signals from the Periphery is a favorite. It has these, it talks about alternative practices of graphic design. Um, and this is, Probably you can only find this at Drawdown. I don't think it's available. So we had places. to work really hard to get this from Eastern Europe. We saw it at a book fair in France. We got a personal copy and, and it, I think it took us about a year and a half in order to work out the international shipping and get copies here. Um, but that's that's one of the real sort of efforts that we think is so important um, is to get these things that are, are produced um, maybe in smaller siloed areas and, and you know bring them to a North American audience and to an international audience. But we love to look closely at the typography in these books. So for example, uh, Bakke uh, in one part of this book is in conversation with Marguerite Hume. Um, and they note that they're having this, con they're both, they both speak French naturally, but they decided to record this conversation in English to make it more available. And we really love the way that they treated uh, this kind of interview. So when Marguerite is talking, you can see it highlighted here, MH. But when she talks again, it's, it's, you know, the MH is denoted. So there's this interesting pattern that they're presenting typographically as these kind of different moments of speaking, right? So here, Abake says they're like bouncers in nightclubs. And then three different uh, statements by Marguerite here. So we're fascinated by these typographic details and the choices that designers make that change the way that we read and experience um, something like this. So it's always about uh, the kind of the context and not the rules, right? Also thing of noting is the way that uh, when a call ended or drops, that's a part of the conversation, right? So this can easily be edited out. But in terms of the editorial decision to keep that in there, I think is really, really kind of interesting. 
or uh, you know, calling back and the voice messaging. When you start speaking again, you're naturally talking in French, and then you sort of revert to the agreed upon English format. So we love this. Here you can see a whole run of Marguerite's talking denoted by many different um, initials here. Usually the typical convention that you would see is like the initials once when someone starts talking, and then it would um, be the next initials when the next person starts talking. Um, also the way uh, these designers in, in use the question mark um, in as well as the smiley face. So these are the kind of delights that we like that when you look close, you can kind of really appreciate. Another title that we um, are glad to carry is Design Dedication, Adaptive Ment Mentalities and Design Education. Um, and there's some interesting formatting uh, things happening here with these really long lines at the start of each person's voice. So Michelle, Chris Lee, um, and that creates just a wonderful sort of texture of these open spaces. So every designer is really kind of tr thinking about it differently in these spaces. And you get these also interesting word blocks that's determined by the length of each person's voice within these different conversations. Um, another uh, great release that was printed entirely in Rizograph in just one print run was Thought Experiments in Graphic Design. And this is from Books in the Future in the UK, which is a a, a, a sort of a summer program, but also a small publisher where they would produce sort of experimental design publications. And Drawdown would have loved to reprint mm -hmm. this, but I, they couldn't get the permissions of all the people involved. But here's a really different way that they treated the, the interviews. So you have like Renz, Armad, Renz, and a lot of big space between each of these person's name, and they didn't use initials, so entirely different. And again, this is really about context, not, not rules, you know, and that's the way we believe in terms of designing. So this only works because each speaker is kind of speaking for a really long time. Uh, it, this would break apart if each person only had like one sentence back and forth, the format would not work at all. Um, this release, which we just got in stock, Artists as Iconographers, has a wonderful sort of flip out cover here. Um, and again, when you read the text, it rotates 90 degrees and also just a great pattern of these indented questions between uh, interviewer and interviewee. Um, and finally, uh, Slavs and Tatars uh, Friendship of Nations book, you know, they have this uh, conversation between two, two individuals and a system in this grid in terms of the typography of really narrow uh, Adam's voice is a sort of narrow column, but it creates such an interesting, unusual system of all of these blocks of voices and typography. And one of the things we wanted to point out is that these are inventions and, you know, is the point just to be sort of a gimmick or is it sort of to extend the concept that is sort of embedded in the conversation or you know like is it the form responding to the function of the book um, and I think that the best books are designed with that in, in mind like they're very aware of the context um, and that these are ways that you can invoke sort of design to to be more con continuous and to extend the messaging that's sort of within the conversation. Um. Another thing that we'd like to think about is sort of groundbreaking non-design design publications. So these are publications that I think you might buy because it's great, interesting, inventive design, even if it's not about design, because a lot of the titles we've shown are often with about design. And this is really the details in the margin. So when I was a design student in the 90s, I bought a lot of Reagan magazine with because of the design David Carson was doing, not because I was interested in the content, but I was really curious, like, what is the, what's going on with the typography here? I'm so interested and fascinated by it. Um, and we would say that uh, in, in a similar way, we found that o Oasis, which is kind of means Oasis. Um, this is a magazine that Carol Martin's designs with students from Workplatz, um, and it's an architectural journal. And uh, the, there's a different uh, cl student collaborator um, for, for every issue. So the covers are, of course, wonderful. The table of contents often starts on the cover. But there's just really, we always love getting the new issues and, and getting them online. There's just really interesting things that happen within this framework of the grid and a sort of academic journal. Um, and the, it has to be highly functional, right? But here, this sort of like uh, footer is like tucked really narrowly into the gutter. Um, and that's kind of quite unusual and interesting to see. Or in this issue, it's dip totally different typefaces, right? Like the hierarchy of the artists, the authors rather, there's four of them, the title and the subtitle and how that flows into the, the typography. Or, you know, really looking, we love looking at footnotes um, and endnotes uh, in, in these publications here. 
And then with this particular issue, the negotiation between OAS 63, the, the page number, um, and then the footnotes, and then the text too, kind of everything close together is really kind of uh, quite, yeah. And, and this issue, the running footer, which is usually on the bottom or the top or the side, cuts through the center of the publication. So on some of the pages with the grid, it totally clears all of the content, right? So that, that seems like an interesting system. And what we love about uh, these kind of inventive typographic systems is how they sort of play out. So in other spreads, it will run right through the content. Um, so these are the kind of like just really wonderful surprises when you're constantly looking at things and seeing what, what is possible within the different systems. Another thing we really, really love at Drawdown is learning from bilingual systems, right? Because it's twice as much typography in giving the designer and the reader the texture and the kind of hierarchy. So this publication that we carry from Hervé Fisher, who kind of straddles, interestingly, between the art world and the design world, um, and we encountered his exhibition at the Centre Pompidou, really does some uh, unusual things too. Here you can see the French and English title kind of combined in the center, the French on top of the circle, the English on the bottom. Uh, the typography throughout is treated in two different weights with the French being slightly heavier. Um, and then this was a publication designed by Sulky and Min for Carol Martin still moving an exhibition in 2018. So you can see a wonderful weight between the Korean and the English text here. And the way it has a relationship both to Sulky and Min's work and Carol Martin's. Um, Art Book in China released recently the PayPal, which also has just a wonderful spreading out and kind of combining of the Chinese typography and the Latin letter forms. I mean, the wonderful weight here um, between those all cap Latin characters and then the, the, the Chinese lettering here. And just throughout like, just what, I mean, we just, this was a, such a great, we sold out of this and we can't get more, but um, Idea Magazine too, if, if, if you have not seen it, is definitely a magazine re we recommend from Japan. But again, really just English and, and the Japanese characters and the way that you can see these combinations of ordering the world with the, the Japanese characters, contributors profile. So the, the way that the designers have to navigate using all of these letter forms and in this editorial magazine space where it's, it's a little bit freer than say a book, book design. Um, and then OS 66 virtually here also um, prints in Dutch and English. So here you see this sort of bi-level uh, approach to it. And then in another issue, sometimes we've seen a lot of things try to treat it the same type size sizes, but here the Dutch is much wider and, and bigger and the English is a bit narrower and smaller and a little bolder. So all of these different ways to kind of approach uh, different results. Uh, yeah, we're, we definitely love bilingual, trilingual publications. We think they're, they're useful sort of in broadening uh, the audience for the publication, but it's also really interesting as designers to say, see the way multilingual work is treated. And I think one of the core interests in Drawdown is really the learning th through publishing. And, you know, we, we love so many publications that are done by students or, you know, like recently graduated students and Des graphic design programs, things that people have self that often don't get beyond their little circles. So through Drawdown, we're able to get wider distribution for these. One project that um, Kathleen found out about was a line which forms a volume, and we've been selling uh, these since since the first edition in in 2015. And these are produced by the London College of Communication. So I mean, really kind of inventive things happening here with the the sort of footnotes um, and the way they sort of invade the typography. Um, here in the kind of white space. Uh, and issue two came out in 2018. And they are really conceiving this as a sort of uh, way for the students to interact with people beyond just the program itself. Um, and they're developing this content. And, and then it developed into these symposiums um, where they release it and they have presentations about each of the content contents. Uh, the most recent issue we have from 2019 sort of fosters collaboration between emergent and established research practices and design. And I think we just got a press release of issue four that'll be out soon that we're, we're quite excited about. But it keeps, I mean, often we've seen like um, schools sometimes just put out mm -hmm. one, but what's, what's impressive with the line that forms the volume is that now they'll be on their fourth, fourth issue. Can I, AI be creative? So like really tackling really interesting topics. Um, another favorite here at Drawdown is Test Press, which is 20 years of student publications from 1999 to 2019. This was published by Hank Groendijk, 
uh, probably didn't say that correctly, but a Dutch designer, collector, and teacher. So it's, it's a really wonderful publication of all of these different student design publications. Here you can see uh, the zebra pieces by Moonsik Kang. Um, wonderful typography throughout. Um, there's interviews and then there's these indexes, but I mean, this is just the kind of invaluable resource of seeing this uninhibited creativity that, that students are able to And do. I also think it's such an important document because so much is produced in school that doesn't reach outside you know, the, the tower. Um, and here you have an educator who's been lovingly collecting all of that work from his students over the years and then is able to put it all together. Um, he's done numerous exhibitions and this book has just, you know, we send it all over the world. Um, and the, and the, I think there's such a need for us to recognize the history, uh, um, the history that's being produced Produced by the schools and the sort of the research that's conducted in the schools as well. And thinking about Robert Adams and his photo book and the way that we saw that kind of typography and the sensibility of that with the photos and the page, you can see here too Hank's approach to the design of this kind of like rotated image and type and this sort of brick, you know. And I think a lot of this like idea of looking as learning is, you know, we're always standing on the shoulders of the people who came before us, right? So I think this publication too, by these students producing publications and sharing them with future years, that inspires and has people build and build to more kind of complex, interesting, um, and, and wider array of, you know, topics mm -hmm. and sort of design issues. Um, there's also the Wonder Years, which was the Workplatz typography, which covered their first 10 years a great resource, very hard to find right now. I think Kathleen saw it for like $500 on Amazon, but this is the kind of uh, release Drawdown loves to, to carry and, and is a really invaluable resource. And we hope more and more schools will publish these types of um, programs. We've had wonderful publications that were independently produced like For Within Graphic Design, For With and In the Browser, which was produced by John Caserta um, with RISD students and faculty. Uh, Tropes, which was a CalArts uh, produced publication um, in 2016 and sold out quite quickly. One of our favorites um, in recent years was the Lawrence Bruner's typographer in residence. Um, just a fabulous um, and the exhibition. Is, and this is from the HMCT uh, typographer in residence program. Um, so these sorts of catalogs are things that are super precious to us. Um, they're usually really well designed because they're, they're produced by designers um, from design faculty, but they're also, you know, richly um, connected to graphic design practice and research. So this is the number one typographer in residence. And it's just a great documentation of the beautiful exhibition. It had all these like neon signs. Um, and then Kathleen and I are both educators. We teach a class at RISD called the Newly Formed. And we have produced uh, broadsides for every class um, where about the letter forms that the students make. So this is the part where we, we say we're, we're encouraging design educators, you know, to bring publishing into the classroom whenever possible and within whatever means they have um, and, and showing how, how we do it in our own practice. Um, and then we went on to produce this in two color offset. And then again, these we usually distribute um, for free on campus and then we sell um, on, on drawdown. For a nominal fee. And um, it's just a great way. We also noticed that when we produce this and we give it out to the new classes that it helps that the students aren't repeating all of this, the same approaches to building these experimental letter forms, but they're really pushing to make new. So as we build this larger and larger library, um, here's the 2019 edition, we're finding more and more um, newer letter forms and not as much sort of repetition because we're able to sort of share and distribute the work that came before and it's not just lost in that classroom in, in, in with time. Um, and we've also uh, played with um, producing larger volumes through digital printing like Blurb and Lulu. Here was uh, Reformed, which took all of the projects they did throughout the semester and kind of remixed them up. And um, we, and I think what newly formed, we're always interested in that class being public facing and interested in means of distribution and display and just sharing the work outside of the classroom walls. And with the most recent class, we had the opportunity to extend publishing into sort of um, exhibition and program programmatic. Um, and this was our brief, which was Z, 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 Z. So all 11 projects during the semester started with a different Z word, zig or zag, for example, were two projects. Um, and we had an opportunity to uh, mount a show that's now open in Shanghai 
China. On this red banner, you can see all of the briefs for the class um, here. And two of the sort of big phrases we said because we had taught online was let me share my screen. Um, and the, there's a huge mural of all of the different works presented in um, windows like Photoshop and Apple preview windows because that was how we encountered the work. And also a, a vinyl installation of Sorry, I Was On Mute, which Kathleen and I um, say quite a lot. And so really like this exhibition was just another way of of expressing and the, the idea of publishing and sharing and distributing distributing work. And, and there will be a catalog as well produced from this that hopefully we'll, we'll be able to extend the reach of that publication once it's produced. So Drawdown is also very interested in sort of sharing the work that comes out of these ephemeral events. So exhibitions, things that are being produced that are printed matter um, that, you know, aren't moving through book channels, type specimens for interest. For instance, that's also things that we tend to, to, to share through Drawdown. And I think that that piece about conversations that we showed earlier, that we do think that all of these, these pieces are talking to one another through time. Um, the student work talks to the work of, of the design um, classics that we hold and the, the new design classics that come down the road. So um, yeah, if you're interested in, if you're in Shanghai, China, you can check out that exhibition until August 1st. Um, we'll have a panel this Sunday uh, morning at 10 a.m. on Eastern Standard Time with five of the students from the class called From Zero to Zebra. So um, check that out if you're interested in learning more. We put the gallery's Instagram on there and you can find Kathleen and I at Drawdown Books, uh, newly formed. Um, and so that's, that's our talk. We really wanna thank Gloria and Clifford and everybody for um, inviting us. Yes, thank you. Thank you everyone for listening to us <laughs> talk. Well, well, thank you. Do you have, we have a few minutes for some questions. And I knew this was going to happen. Someone's going to ask if you accept book proposals and what is your curatorial process for accepting books? Maybe you might want to explain a little bit um, about how you go about accepting book proposals. So we definitely like, because we distribute, we definitely accept all like submissions for distribution, we encourage people to do, you know, self-publishing. Um, for people who are really interested in publishing on a larger scale, we don't often have like a big budget, but Kathleen um, actually knows quite a lot of the larger publishers like Princeton Architectural Press and has made some big connections. Like I think the Extra Bold book that just came out, Kathleen kind of helped with that connection and, and a few others um, in terms of, uh, yeah, connecting people with publishers who have a, a much larger budget than us. So generally on our website, we say we don't accept uh, publication proposals just because like our budget tends to be so limited. And we are sort of, we have, I think three or four books in process right now that we're working on. So we find it difficult to extend, but we can offer resources <laughs> and moral support. Right. Um, and, that, and that's the way that we tend to work. And I also will always encourage people to self-publish as well, because I can give resources mm -hmm there, but I think that allows you, one, if you're a designer, you'll have much more oversight over the entire design process um, and all the production, and you can use that as a, a way to learn. Um, you know, if you partner with us, I think any sort of publisher that's run by a design designer, um, they'll want to have a hand in the design often. Um, so, so there's negotiating that. So that's why if you're looking for a publisher, you might want to look for a publisher that, that isn't sort of a designer themselves, because you can kind of see how those conflicts can arise. Um, but we would like to encourage you, um, and I can certainly help point you um, in many directions, depending on how that conversation went. And I think self-publishing is very interesting today, because there are so many sources, and you talk about this again, you know, technology, um, even in the printing world, has gotten to the point of you know, using a risograph, digital printing, limited edition printing is so much easier today than, um, let's say, going to a major publisher. And you can self-publish. That's what we do here at the HMCT. All of our books are self-published. And we did try online publishing. I think you have less control when you use, you know, um, the online publishers than you would if you use a, a, some of your, like you say, local printers who have adapted to using risographs and digital printing. And it's also a good way to support the industry still, to support you know, smaller printers within your communities, within your cities. 
And I agree, when you are self-publishing, you have an incredible amount of control. And I know all designers and typographers, <laughs> that seems to be crucial in terms of how they want their books to be published. Um, again, um, thank you so much. I mean, there's so much to, we can continue talking forever and ever. And we'll, we're gonna talk more about how we could involve Drawdown Books more in typographically within the world, within the HMCT. And thank you so much for supporting educational publishing. I, I think that's crucial to maintain a catalog of what's taught in education. And I, I'm also very grateful that you have this timeline of maintaining a timeline of what is being taught in education and how it's changed, how typography has changed, how book design is changing. Um, and, and I think what you show is there's, a, there's definitely a change, I think, to the page. You know, the way, in, and I think you showed that already, you, you know, especially with interviews and with, um, you know, how the conversation happens in a book. And why do you think that has happened? Why do you think there's been such a radical change? You know, I was, I was thinking about this because we really like, you know, did sort of a deep dive into interviews. And I thought, why are we so interested in this? And I, I actually was thinking about the prevalence of podcasts and conversations in, in culture. Like there is a lot more interest. And I, I wouldn't say it's just be, because of the pandemic, but um certainly in in visual culture um you know there is this the interview has taken on a greater sort of position um both through podcasting and youtube i think one thing we've seen is a flattening where there used to be interviews of established people but now you know anyone can start a po podcast and have a really discrete area that they're interested in and interview people within that circle and sort of create uh, like a larger vessel to communicate more widely with the world and i think the power of the conversation has become more visible and maybe that is why there's more interest in sort of the print version of that also taking on um, different visual characteristics so I, I i don't know i'm just spitballing i was just <laughs> thinking about this the other day no i i i think you're actually you're absolutely right about the need for this referring back to information and you show that in a lot of the books you know contemporary books it's not just about here's a pretty picture Here's the conversation that happens with the work that's being designed, whether it's a photograph, whether it's architecture, whether it's graphic design, whether it's a typeface, you are now seeing the conversation of the content, which is again, a, a fabulous educational tool and a tool, you know, whether you're a student, a designer, or just historically, the amount of historical information that we're able to capture now is you know in terms of being much more detailed in the information and i also think that comes with allowing the books the content and the design of the books to expand you know it's not here's the you know we've come far from traditional book design you know where this is how a book is set up with these margins and you don't go beyond that and and i think you really show that a lot of individual designers and typographers are really pushing that concept. I think this idea, you know, there's hacking culture. People want to <laughs> hack the book. Um, and I also think there's this push and pull with like the, the material that's online, you know, as we're spending a lot more time looking at screens, the preciousness of the printed word like become something else and how can we really you know use the qualities of the book in ways that are special and that sort of invigorate that form um certainly one of the things i'm really interested in is there's so much that gets put online and i think um as chris mentioned i was an archivist and i was really i've been really interested in digital preservation um and the idea that something is online does not mean that it's going to be there for future generation. Yeah. There's been some really great writing recently about link rot, um, but also the way that things are so, I mean, part of the, the beautiful thing about the web is that it, it's not static, it's constantly changing. But that means that that the texts that we have are, are not reliable texts 
that are online, nor might they, you know, materials be there in the future. So that's why I continue to see books. You know, we've seen year decades <laughs> gutenberg's books in the 15th century are still with us so we know that that is a secure form in which to transmit knowledge so that's why i see the book continuing to be really relevant and, and critical right right well again um thank you again both of you christopher and kathleen we really 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 appreciate everything you do for the typographic and design world thanks and i think thank one you. of your your past talks with the, the computational design had us up up all of our books on processing and code now. So we've we're expanding a whole code <laughs> section based on how great that talk was. That and, and that's the sort of interchange that's so important. Yeah, yeah I know. Um, so thank you again, and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you everyone. It was great. Thank to, you to talk with you. Thanks, Gloria. Thank you. Bye.